Welcome, everyone, to the Two Real Cinema Club. My name is Andres Lorente. And I am James Rosica. And every episode on the Two Real Cinema Club, we watch two movies. We watch a new movie and an old movie, and then we try and compare like with like, sometimes like with not very like. Um, this episode, uh, we are making money. You will, so you, you may remember. Do you remember this Robert Altman's 1992 film, The Player? Did you ever see that? Love that film. Yes, I did. A couple times. And there's a scene in that film which strikes fear into the heart of every screenwriter where Peter Gallagher is a studio executive and he says, we don't need writers. Yeah. He picks up the newspaper and he says, all the stories we'll ever need are right here in the newspaper. And then he reads out a couple of random headlines and pitches some stories. Yeah. So... Now, today, that sentiment is more refined than ever because this episode, we have a film based not on a newspaper story, uh, but on a Reddit thread. I I was wondering, how long is it going to be before we have the first film based on a tweet? It will, well, it will only, it'll only be so long. Yeah. It would be an X, though, wouldn't it? Do we have tweets oh, yes. anymore? I don't, I don't do tweets here. <laughs> what no, do you so, call so, I think you call you call them exes, but that's called I call them kisses, which doesn't oh. doesn't quite make sense because it seems like <laughs> the most aggressive and unpleasant place. Yeah. If if there were kisses, it would just be a little bit more affectionate and pleasant, I think. Yeah. Oh, that is a nice touch. Kisses. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so, do you ever go to Reddit? No. 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 <laughs> I, had, I no. hadn't seen it before we watched Dumb Money. That was the first time I've ever seen Reddit. Ah. Um, I, I go a little bit to Reddit. I, um, it's a strange place. I, uh, only go there to watch videos of people I don't know playing synthesizers that I can't afford. That's what I'd go to Reddit <laughs> for. But, uh, this episode, there is a whole film based on a Reddit yeah. thread. It is dumb money, uh, out in cinemas. Now we are comparing it to a film from 40 years ago. Yes, you did hear that correctly. 40 years ago, trading places. Uh, covers much the same ground. It, it hurts so much to hear it be 40 years old. <laughs> like Recently, we watched something that was 80 years before the other, right? I think it was when we did Mission Impossible and the 39 Steps. Right, yeah. That That's that's fine. That's fine. But 40 years ago is not fine because I remember seeing this <laughs> film when it came out. So, you know, 80 years, I couldn't possibly be that old. But 40 years plus, I can be that old. And that's, that's depressing. That is depressing. Yeah. Well, huh. speaking speaking of depressing, yeah. where can people find us on Instagram? I wish they would find us more often at the, the Gmail, because you can email us at tworealcinemaclub at gmail.com. Um, you can read the blog at tworealcinemaclub.com. And on Instagram, we are at tworealcinemaclub. So those are some places to find us. Um, the best thing to do, though, is talk to your friends because they might be lonely. You might be able to strike up a conversation based on what you learn or just what you could actually bear to <laughs> listen to on our podcast. I don't know. But tell your friends about us. Leave a review if you can. Um, and we are, boy, we're practically ubiquitous at this point. Apple Podcasts. The soon-to-be-defunct Google Podcasts. Yeah, they're, they're bending that off, aren't they? I think next next January, something like that. So, so listen to us on Google Podcasts while you still can. Yeah, yeah. It might sound different over there. Get a, get a listen in <laughs> over there. Spotify, also YouTube, iHeartRadio, wherever else you get your podcasts. Just find us. You will. Unless you're super lazy. You'd be, you'd be really lazy if you were looking for us and couldn't find couldn't us. Couldn't find we, us. <laughs> we are that uh, ever-present these days. And it's good to be ever-present. It's good to be back. I heard your interview with... Um, Earl last week on his film Tim, um, that was lovely. And you know who else is back? Who else is back? Razor. Razor is back. He called you Razor a couple times. I love that. <laughs> I haven't been using Razor enough lately, so I'll get back into that a bit more. Um, Earl, it was an inspirational. It's an it's an inspirational journey that he had to make that film, and just also he re inspired me to to use Razor. I was of course just in a mess of trouble that day. I was um, waiting for, well, I used Alexa to get a (laughs) a car and they sent me one of these self-driving things. I got in, that's fine. And then we started getting lost everywhere. I think you mentioned this too. They put like a, apparently if you put a traffic cone, one of those orange cones on top of the hood of the car, it just just freaks out. They stole, yes. (laughs) So I just hung out and I just listened to podcasts there while I was waiting for someone to bail me out. They, uh, they don't have a bathroom in those cars, do they? They don't. They don't. But you can take that cone. You take the cone and you just put your hand over the bottom of it to cover the hole. It's not the best system, but... Well, so let's, let's, talk about, let's, let's, um, let's talk about Dumb Money then. Yeah, let's talk about it. Dumb Money. This is a brand new film, 2023. As you said, it's sort of based on uh, 
a Reddit thread. It's a tr largely a true story. I think at the beginning they tell you based on true events, but it, it felt very real. Um, I think the writer um, of the story is Ben Mesrich, who actually wrote, I guess, the book for anti... Well, he called it the anti-social network. It became the social network, I believe. Uh, Billions and 21. So he's written some books, and I think he... He had the material, he had the idea, and then he wrote the book hoping that it would be made into a film. I think he kind of has this. I listened to an interview on the on National Public Radio over here, and he sort of has that that routine where he can write a book about something, but really he's not looking for a Pulitzer Prize. He's looking for someone to buy the property and make it into a film. So he was successful yeah, okay. here. Clever trick. Um, directed by Craig uh, Gillespie, who did a film that I saw over in London years ago, Lars and the Real Girl. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Is that good? It's pretty clever, yeah. Nice little independent style film. He um, Gillespie also did I, Tanya a few years ago with uh, Margot Robbie and fantastic uh, film. I love that one. That's based on the Tanya Harding, the um, figure skater who benefited from ugh, an unfortunate accident of Nancy <laughs> Kerrigan having her knees clubbed by Tanya's boyfriend. But I think it was an accident, as I recall. Um, so that she was able to compete and not do well in the Olympics, but she at least didn't have to battle too much with Nancy Kerrigan. Um, I, uh, the only film of Craig Gillespie's that I've seen is Cruella, which is the, the Disney 101 Dalmatians prequel. Oh, I have not seen that. Uh, with Emma Stone, uh, which is uh, really not very good. Oh, well, he also did Pamela and Tommy, which is the oh. Pamela Lee Anderson and Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, or Tommy, no, Tommy Lee, sorry, not Tommy Lee Jones. Ooh, that'd be weird if Pamela, jo Pamela Anderson hooked up with Tommy Lee Jones. That would have been a different uh, <laughs> different marriage altogether. Maybe that one would have stuck together. Tommy Lee, the drummer from uh, Motley Crue, or Motley Crue, depending on how much respect you have for umlauts. Um, and a lot of the actors who are in Tommy, Pamela and Tommy, are in this film. Uh, Seth Rogen's in there. Um, Sebastian also, Stan is in there, isn't he? Yeah, yep. He's in there. Um, so he obviously has some... Um, Oh, Nick Offerman was the other one. Um, obviously has some some actors who like to work with him. Um, screenplay was written by Lauren Shooker Bloom, who wrote for Orange is the New Black. It seems, seems like she has a partnership with the other writer, Rebecca Angela, so the two of them look like they work together on things like um, Orange is the New Black. So I think this was maybe their first or second feature script. Uh, I to think so. I think it's their first, pro I think their first produced feature script. Yeah, good cast. Paul Dano, Vincent D'Onofrio, Pete Davidson, America Ferreira, uh, Shaley Woodley, Seth Rogen, Nick Offerman, Talia Ryder, and Anthony Ramos. So yeah, it's some people we've seen in films of all different shapes and sizes. Um, I, boy, I was not prepared for this one. I, Went to see this in the theater. Right. And I always take like a pen, two, three pens. I like to have backup and then folded <laughs> paper. So I'm sitting there scribbling. I try and sit close. So I've got some light from the screen. Right. And within the first five minutes, my Sharpie 3 gel pen. Do you guys have the th Sharpie 3 over there? In, oh, uh... I think we're stuck on Sharpie without oh, yeah. a number at all. Oh, this is great. It's a, it's a gel pen. It writes, um, it's not like a marker. It's definitely much more of a pen, but it's just, the ink just flows beautifully. But within five minutes, it was gone. And then I had backup. As I said, I usually carry a few pens, but we're getting into autumn here now. So I'm wearing these things with all these different <laughs> pockets on them. So I had like 20 pockets and I didn't check the right pocket at any point. So I never found the backup pen and I just kind of went without. It was nice because I just enjoyed the film. <gasps> but the only notes I had... So my synopsis might not be the strongest one, but the only notes I had were uh, Paul Dano plays Inside Man at Mass Mutual. Right. He's a good guy. He's a good guy, and he's got a YouTube short shot, um, a show about money. It looked like he was shooting on YouTube, but I guess it's a Reddit thing. I kind of learned that later. Oh, no, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it is YouTube because is you it? can still watch his videos. So he, oh, he plays his character, Keith Gill. Yeah. Um, who is like a real person. And you can go and look at Keith Gill's videos on YouTube. They're still there. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And he shows his own spreadsheets of his banking information. So he's you know trying to show his followers that he's real. And his wife, Caroline Shaylin Woodley, is in on it. And then the ink just started drying up and running out. So that's what I had. <laughs> but it was great because that left me with a chance to go back and think about it and write a real synopsis, which I'm happy to do right now. Is there music that we play before this happens? Oh, yes. Or? Should we play the synopsis music? Do it. Do it. Paul Dano is Keith Gill, known as Roaring Kitty online. 
in the Reddit world of, uh, as we said, maybe YouTube video posts of um, 2020-2021 Pandemic America. Um, he's convinced of this untapped value of the GameStop uh, company stock. It's a brick-and-mortar store. I'd never heard of it. Um, and it serves a, this sort of loyal clientele of gamers who are still buying games on discs and various peripherals in person, so it's almost become an obsolete business. But um, he's starting to encourage people to um, buy their stocks. He has perhaps some inside knowledge on major head funds who are intentionally driving down the value of the stock, I guess, so that they can liquidate the company for profit. Um, Roaring Kitty has lots and lots of followers on Reddit that buy the stock as well, so they end up driving up the prices and making money for the little guys who are they themselves. Um, That might be a good place to... Ring a spoiler bell or something because I'll go let's into ring a, bit a spoiler more. bell. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're, right. You ready? You ready? Yes. You ready? Please. Yes. Please. Oof. Right. Okay. So inspirational. I feel like we're moving right along. We get some. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's the What's momentum. the bell they ring on Wall Street? Oh, that's it. That, that's actually like a proper hammer bell. It's usually a guest. Uh, uh, can be like a school group or uh, someone famous who comes in. Or when you do your IPO offering, I think you're allowed to hit that bell. But there's some like a rubber hammer, and you're just hitting on this bell. Do you want to change the sound for this one episode, or do we just stick with the bell we got? No, I think I, I feel like our bell is better than theirs. Better the bell you get than the bell you don't. What does what does the bell actually mean at Wall Street? Does it mean you know start start yeah. ripping off the little man now? Yes, now begin. Right, okay, right. And we're going to see that in trading places. I'd forgotten how ridiculous that whole the whole trading system just <laughs> makes no sense to me. It's totally antiquated and obviously unfair. But uh, I think that's by design. No. <laughs> and that's the point of this film. That's the, the point big of the guys film. so often get their way with us, <laughs> and this film is all about the little guy um, coming out on top. So this is a David and Goliath story. Um, the story fleshes out really quite naturally and wonderfully by um, um, they follow this guy, Roaring Kitty. He's kind of unfashionable, um, but in terms of economics and technology, he's a gifted nerd, and he's in his basement, but his followers are really crucial to the story. I wouldn't say, call it a multi-protagonist film, but we definitely get a lot of their stories, the people who are in on the um, stock buying with him. So America Ferrer is a, a beleaguered, indebted nurse in Pittsburgh, I think she was. Right. Um, Anthony Ramos actually works for GameStop at some mall in Detroit. Uh, and then there's some college students in Austin, Texas, and all of whom uh, invest on the advice and, and these open spreadsheets and bank stick, uh, statements of Roaring Kitty. And they're all using this phone application called Robin Hood. And the, the first time they talked about Robin Hood, I thought it was Robin Hood. Oh. Uh, yeah, I had to figure out that, no, it, Robin wasn't part of the name of the app. It's a fine line, isn't it? Yeah. Then maybe it should be. Well, the distinction is I think Robin Hood was this, um, I think it might still exist. It's this uh, easy to use, I guess, phone app for people who want to just buy stocks on their own. Um Little did I know that the little guys who are just buying little, you know, penny, what they call penny stocks or, or low value stocks, we are known as dumb money in the industry. <laughs> so that's the, hence the name of the film. Uh, Robin Hood's poser billionaire founders um, disable their application at a critical moment in the stock rise, uh, sowing some doubt not only of the futures of all the characters involved, but also of the influence of the. Um, hedge fund bad guys who are losing money and they want to stop losing money. So the big money comes in. That's Seth Rogen, Nick Offerman, and to a lesser extent, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio's character, um, who are hedge fund managers who are really betting on the stock, basically just wiping down to zero so that they can um, basically sell off the company, as far as I understood. Um, There's a lot of real-world footage of the actual investors, the politicians who get involved, the journalists involved in the case, and that really lends uh, real authenticity to the film, I saw an interview with Gillespie um, where he said, yeah, he didn't want to, like, recreate it Mm -hmm. using actors to play somewhat famous people. Um, So the interviews are actually sort of done with his actors sitting in for the – the people who are the real characters in in the the actual story. Um, But they're actually sort of talking to people like um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a politician here in the United States, and and journalists on television as well. So it's – She's probably apart from – Biden and Trump, he's probably the only American politician that a lot of people would recognize in the UK. 
Good. She's the one to know. Um, yeah, for sure. We, but yeah, we all think she's fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. nice to see her on, on the big screen. Oh, yeah. It was great to see her on that. And, you know, she's she's she can be very tough, but she's also very relatable herself. So this film is really relatable, too, I think. And and that has a, a big uh, a, a big effect on it. It's just the fact that we see real life people that uh, we know. Um, Keith and his wife have a baby daughter. There aren't they're not too very well off. Um, so all of a sudden they're just loaded their newfound riches make big differences in their lives um pete davidson plays this goofy still living at home adult brother who offers uh, snippets of wisdom and comedy throughout and he sort of co-grieves with keith about the death of their sister who's recently died perhaps due to covid that was the idea i had yeah i i i inferred that she had died from covid yeah. okay well that's the medical opinion i was about to ask <laughs> thank you sir um yeah it, it there are a lot of masks in this film. It takes place during that winter of 20 to 21. I think early 21 is where a lot of it happens. Um, so people are in masks. It's very effective um, because, it, again, it feels like a real snapshot of a certain time. And there was just so much um, economic upheaval at that time, mm. um, emotional upheaval. So it's, it, it captures that, those six or eight months of, of intense COVID um, really, really well, I thought. Um, as I said before, David Gar versus Goliath's kind of story of small-time investors known as dumb money sticking it to the big guys. But the big guys, of course, stave off some damage due to collusion. It seems like the, <laughs> the big investors sort of told Robin Hood to shut down the program for just long enough to for them to regroup. So um, definitely the big money has its way at some points but in the end the little guys kind of claim both a moral and a monetary victory a lot of people made money off of it um and it all sort of it gives us a little bit of hope for the future i felt like we can do this again and then maybe again and again and again and uh it was an interesting film and it i understand i understand things a little bit better after seeing this film <laughs> but the truth is i still don't understand anything about that kind of uh, stock market uh, manipulation so i think i think the stock market stuff is probably better explained in um trading places yeah. we'll come back to that later yeah. i i um like you i i enjoyed this film but it took me a while before i started to enjoy it i think um this film has one uh one aspect which i think is very unusual today there is something about this film which i haven't seen in a film for I feel like quite a quite a long time. Um, this film, unusually, it has a very weak opening. I think mm. I feel like it's so rare to see a film that starts badly, and I think this film starts terribly. Mm. It it kind of tries to start like you know, in in the middle of the the kind of the stock crisis with all the characters that we don't know yet looking at their phones, kind of swearing at how oh, yeah. you know, obviously the cost of something has gone up or gone down or some shocking thing has happened. Yep. Um, and uh, and I find myself kind of thinking, I don't, I'm, wrong. I'm supposed to feel something here, but I'm not entirely sure what it is. And it's mm -hmm. just supposed to be like, it felt a little bit like um, a teaser at the start of a television show, oh, reminding yeah. you not to switch over because something dramatic will happen later on in the show. But you know, we're in a cinema and, and I'm not going to switch over and go to another screen. I'm, I'm here for the duration. You don't need to tease me at the opening of the film. Yeah. You know, and then after we have this kind of, this kind of strange opening where we don't know the characters. There's this, this, this kind of terrible introduction to Keith where he's in this bar talking to an old buddy and basically they explain to each other what the story is. And then a third character, this server, comes and she kind of, she enters the scene and she has the details explained to her. And then kind of, you know, like the, I think even the introductions of the minor characters are all pretty terrible, really. There's a whole bunch of terrible um, introduction scenes. Like, you know, this is terrible kind of lesbian meet cute at a party which i think is mm. supposed to be funny but i just didn't really think it was funny and not particularly enlightening yeah. there's this kind of you know terrible scene of two nurses explaining to each other how the stock market works i mean it's all i really thought the first half hour was uh, really pretty poor yeah um which means that it's kind of double surprise that by the time the film got to like the midpoint and then you know and then the climax the whole thing had completely turned around and i was completely in the moment and it was yeah. really exciting seeing that you know the, the stock value reach eleven million dollars and then you know, rise a bit and then fall and then rise and the characters tussle with shall we sell and become rich or should we stick to our principles and hold on to the stock? Um, you know, it's like they they're kind of making this real choice, comfort or or kind of ideology, mm -hmm. and, and seeing these kind of you know, these really big 
decisions. That's what brings character out. So the, I think the film starts terribly and then somehow manages to rescue it. And I, I was with it from the midpoint onwards. Very early on, don't they do one of these moments where it's six minutes, six, uh, six months earlier or something like that, right? I think they start at uh, some point and then they go back yeah. in time to start telling you the story more chronologically. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's difficult. As I said, they're they're not multi-protagonists, but we're definitely following more than just uh, Rory and Kitty's story. So um, I think as a result, you end up with this kind of large task of exposition that's never going to be very clean. Um, I was, you know, I was looking around for my pen at this point. I mean, so I just... <laughs> I was in it. I was just watching. I just, I really kind of almost gave this film a pass in a sense that I wasn't really writing everything down and following it like that. I was really just going to soak it in and enjoy it. And I, I definitely agree with you. It doesn't have a, a wow beginning or anything like that. And it doesn't have lots of pace. It's, it's a story about, you know, people trading stocks. So it's not like an action <laughs> picture by any means, but I think it does, it does pay off eventually. I mean, I, I found that when he was testifying before Congress, and it was a video testimony, right? I was really moved by that point. I thought it was, yeah. I was definitely on, on their side, and I just loved watching the investors, and it was good to see what a difference it was making in their lives. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily money. I think a lot of people were kind of just enjoying the moral victory as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's not, uh, it's not a quick start. It doesn't have a, a frantic pace early on. And it is a little bit clunky because they are, you know, you're following the hedge fund investors. You've got the Robin Hood guys. You've got Roaring Kitty and his life and his family life and the background story there. And then you've got, I guess they follow three of the major, well, three, three of the, the, the dumb money investors, let's call them, um, at least, right? Because you've got America Ferrara, Anthony Ramos, and then the, the, the two college uh, ladies out there in Austin, Texas, I think. So he's, you know, adding three layers of story. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it, it gets a little complicated. I think it's pretty well done. I'm, I'm, yes, it probably could have been done better, but um, there's a little sense of TV writing in this somehow too. I don't know. If ah. I, my, I don't know if I can put my, yep. my, my finger on it perfectly, but um, you know, this is not a huge production film. It's not a big budget. I don't think um, Craig Gillespie has just done a couple of pretty good um, like limited series things. And so, and, and then you got your writers from orange, uh, is the new blacks. I mean, it, it has a little TV feel to it somehow. I don't know that we say made for TV films anymore. It's all made for various streaming services, right? Or, yeah. Or yeah. Theater, it's so. Kind of made for TV. It's pretending to be the cinema yeah. Yeah, as, as usual. You have completely hit the nail on the head there. That's oh. exactly what it is. I think it's, it's, I think it's largely too talky, this film, and it is because it's TV writing, isn't it? It's TV yeah. writing by two TV writers. Um, doesn't mean they've necessarily done a bad job, but it's, it's a bit over talky. I mean, there is some visual storytelling, isn't there? I did make a note of a couple of things. There's um, a scene where Seth Rogen, who's one of the hedge fund managers, yeah. he's looking at a screen and basically his screen just has lots and lots of red lines and red boxes all over it. Yeah. You know, and kind of the film doesn't need to explain in words that. You know that he's losing losing huge sums of money. You can just see it right yeah. there in the picture. You know, it's that's a nice little bit of visual storytelling. Yeah, and the same with kind of Vincent D'Onofrio's character. He's a hedge fund manager who has a literal pig for a pet. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, do you think this, yeah, this story tells itself? <laughs> so you know, there are moments when they you know they get it completely right. Yeah. Not not subtle, but very good. I mean, but <laughs> yes. in real life, maybe he does have a pig. So. <laughs> Um, and you, you get to see Seth Rogen's property where he's running for, he wants to raise one house next door so he can put in what, a, a different swimming pool or something like that. And then he's running <laughs> yeah. the equivalent of a few football fields to get to his actual house, which is a massive modern mansion. <laughs> so you, you definitely get to see their lives. And I think there's good contrast in the, in, in the characterization between the, the dumb money and the, and the big money as there should be. So, but yeah, it's, it's a talky film and, you know, some of the cinematic stuff is actually bizarrely the stuff that Roaring Kitty does for his YouTube videos. Mm. Like he's he's sort of like a little uh, celebrity himself, and he he sort of takes on this persona with the red uh, bandana folded up and all the cat. For some reason, he has a lot of, <laughs> a lot of feline T-shirts, feline themed T-shirts. There are cats everywhere. He's the <laughs> Roaring Kitty. It's clever. Um, I I think a couple things for me. Um, I remember this story pretty well because it's only a couple of years old, really. It's maybe two yeah. or three years old. And I remember hearing about it in the news and listening to various podcasts discussing it. Um, I didn't really understand it then. I understand it a little bit better right now. Um, but these films are a little hard for me just because I, I 
shouldn't get lost in the details. You should just really focus on the story. But I'm trying to figure out the economics, and that's just a losing battle for me. Um, <laughs> but the the thing that came to me um, a lot was just big guy versus little guy, and this phrase. It's one of the most idiotic phrases I hear very often, but history is written by the winners. Ah. Now, I always hate this because it clearly obfusc- obfuscates the fact that we only get a dishonest and privileged sense of history as a result. <laughs> and while this is somewhat, you know, probably fabricated or dramatized, um, this is a story where you really do get a much more rounded perspective. And that's very fresh. And I love the fact that you've got, you know, not major, but you know, some a filmmaker of some substance um, thinking about making these films, and stars like Seth Rogen um, and others coming into these films and and wanting to make them. This is probably not a big budget film. I can't imagine any one of these actors is making a whole lot of money on it. But yeah. I like the fact. I mean, like Shailene Woodley, it's not a massive part by any means, but she wants to be there. Uh, same for Seth yeah. Rogen. I mean, this is not none of the big stars carry this film, um, but I like the fact that. Um, people are starting to get interested in making these kinds of films. And I, I still don't have the financial literacy to really understand the whole thing, but I like the fact that that spotlight is going on and history is being rewritten a little bit and a lot more honestly as a result. So kudos to the filmmakers for that, I think. I have a bit of a reflection on what the, what the film is really about. Yeah. Because, I mean, as you as you rightly say, I the it's largely a David and Goliath story and that's the way that it's structured and that's the kind of the way that it is sold. And it's a story about ordinary working people, you know, taking on the Wall Street hedge fund managers, you know, and, and you know, that is largely um, what the, nominally what the film is about. But yeah. I think the film is really about something else. Um, when I was kind of saying earlier on that the film is kind of too talky, but it's sometimes... Um, does use some visual storytelling that yeah. um, you know, people who've listened to the pod before will know that um, we especially love the kind of the Rafifi style silent storytelling. Yeah, you know, I think the, you know, the best stories are told without dialogue, but there is one kind of scene I enjoy even more than the scene without dialogue. And that is um, the scenes where the meaning of the scene and the dialogue of the scene are completely perpendicular where things that people are talking about and the things that are actually happening in the scene are, are two completely different things. And I think that is kind of what this film is about because it's it's full of people talking about markets and shares and you know buying and selling and the rich versus the poor. But what it's really about, I think, um, is something completely different. I think it is about connection in an area where people feel and certainly at this point in history felt more distant from each other and more fractionated than ever it's you know it's about people feeling isolated when they can only meet on reddit because they can't meet in person Mm -hmm. when people have their virtual friends on youtube rather than real friends that they can see face to face real friends whose whole faces they can see rather than just the bit that's not covered by a mask there's a scene where the the Austin Texas students um, they're on the phone and one of them says oh you know some guy has made an offer he will pay me five hundred bucks if I chat online with him from a bubble bath come and do that with me yeah. which I'm guessing is some kind of Twitch thing I think that's something that people do on Twitch um, and it's like you know, a symptom of the sheer level of of disconnectedness yeah um, that we see now that we especially saw during the summer of 2020 yeah you know face masks and mm-hmm. shops with no customers and empty streets and people mm-hmm. staring into their phones instead of their faces, their friends' faces. You know, um, it, there's a scene where um, America Ferrari, she goes and gets a vaccination. You know, and even yeah. something as straightforward as that, you know, getting a vaccination to protect yourself from a disease has somehow divided people and, and kind of separated people. I think the film is about division and connection and the all the stuff about, buying and selling shares is a backdrop for that theme. I think that is what the film is really about. And I think that is kind of the story of the 2020s. I think that is largely why the film won me over because it may be the first pandemic film I've seen, mm. you know, that properly talks about the pandemic because it's not claiming to be a film about the pandemic. Yeah. It's a film about stuff that happened during that time, which means that you can obliquely look at it out of the corner of your eye and see it for what it really was. Yeah. Well done. I think you hit it right there. Yeah, this is a film that belongs to a very precise moment. He couldn't really make this film 
um, probably 10 years ago wouldn't have made any sense. And then 10 or 15 years from now, probably, you know, will make less sense. But I think that moment when we were all alone, we were disconnected, but this group of people coming together and actually achieving something at that time when people felt so disempowered, I think, uh, it's very much for that moment. And it is, yeah, it's about connection in a world where it's really hard to connect. And those are people who, yeah, are, have been getting the short stick all along and, they're they're looking up above them at these people who are just loaded and just way too wealthy and how can they exact some kind of revenge or make them hurt a little bit they sort of accomplish something and they just uh you know expose the the uh inequity in the entire um stock market so yeah i uh i agree i think you've got a great point there for i it's it's quite fun to see a film that features characters that we don't often see there are not many films about the guy who works behind the counter at GameStop, you know, or a nurse who mostly does night shifts, or yeah, kind of impoverished college students who have to because those girls are three to a room, I think, aren't they, in Austin, Texas? I mean, yeah, they must be utterly broke. Um, yeah. But despite this being a film all about characters we don't often see on screen, um, I still think I might place a call to the cliche squad. Ooh, please do. I'm curious. Uh, especially now that we're all rolling in dough, I can afford to phone them. Uh, yes. I can afford to drop a... I can't, I can't, still can't remember the name of the coin that I'm supposed to drop. Is it a quarter? It's a dime, isn't it? It's a... Uh, boy, I would say a quarter at least. I haven't it's seen a, a quarter. payphone in decades. It's a, so. a, silver, a silver dollar. Yeah, you're right. I, 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 pull out your I'll, Blackberry. Pull out your Blackberry. Yeah, there we go. Coin. Pull out my bra- Blackberry. <laughs> So, uh, dear Cliché Squad, I'm sorry to call you on this film, but there was one moment that really, really leapt out at me, um, uh, which was people looking at graves and making the sad face. There's uh, there's a scene where kind of, you know, Keith and his family, they all go to his sister's grave and um, it doesn't really add anything to the story, but it it shows that they all feel sad about somebody dying. It's... um, you know, these scenes, like, they're really, really easy to write and they're really, really cheap to make. And so they keep coming up in films again and again. Yeah. But it's, it strikes me as a really terrible cliche and, you know, not really reflective of, of real life. Yeah. I would like to see more ashes, urn, <laughs> people looking at urns of ashes and passing a <laughs> urn of ashes around the table, reflecting, <laughs> talking about their feelings of loss. Um <laughs> Human composting. I'm really getting into human composting. Ah, right now, so yeah, now you're talking. Yeah, someone going to visit the rotting body of a loved one. I think that would be <laughs> anti-cliche. So you're. I think you've got a good one there. But I, I, I'm, I'm afraid to say I don't think I had any. In fact, <gasps> my cliche is misplaced. I remember you. I was having difficulties with pens and stuff. So my cliche for this film, it's not in the right spot, is hooker with a heart of gold. <laughs> but I think that's supposed to go in trading places. So. <laughs> That's the only cliche I had, and it's in the wrong film. There were no. Yeah, I think maybe your sharpie was so full of ink that it pressed through about three pages, and uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's trading places <laughs> cliche that made its way all the way through forty years of pages. I think because uh, it was such a you know largely a true story and a fairly I think honest treatment of it. Um, I didn't really, I couldn't really say that there are any obvious cliches that really hurt me, but that one, yeah, you see that in so many films. Well, there's, I think there's, there's more to say about um, about dumb money, but I think we will come back to it when we yeah. talk about um, trading places trading because places. they do, you know, they overlap a lot. These two films. Why don't we have a break? Good idea. Uh, we'll stretch our legs, yeah, um, and then we'll come back and we'll journey back through forty years and have a look at trading places. Perfect. Sounds good. <laughs> Plotkin character, that's um, Seth Rogen. Yeah. He may have gone to our high school. They keep oh! Talking. There's that oh scene where he says, oh, I'm a working class kid who grew up in Portland, Maine. I went to a public high school. <gasps> so I've been trying to research and I have to go way back. I've got this, I've got access to like this, our infinite campus, but he goes back, I have to be 90. Yeah, it doesn't go back that far. He's. I think he graduated in the 90s. So I'm not, I just don't know. And I, I meant to ask some teachers at school, and I haven't done that yet. But 
Because <laughs> there, there are a couple of private schools. He very clearly says he didn't go to a private school. Remember, he's trying to make it sound like he's a man of the people. He didn't yeah. go to Northwestern. He went to a school in the, in the Midwest or something like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, he puts that in there. And I just, there, there are really only two schools. It's the one I used to teach at and the one I now teach at. So um, I don't know. Oh man, there, there's got to be a photograph of him on the wall somewhere, yeah. surely. Yep. You should. Uh, we we surely should try and get an interview with the real gay popkin <laughs> based on this connection. Yes, you will probably say yes because it doesn't look like he's doing much else these days. So yeah, I, could, I can't verify it, and the the computer program doesn't go back to the '90s. It starts in about 2001 or something like that. So <laughs> right. Oh man, that's staying in the pod. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut that in. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Not tell, not to be confused with Mattel, a major toy maker, <laughs> but not tell, a minor knockoff toy maker, and with the good sense to become sponsors of the Two Wheel Cinema Club, present. Oh, well done. For your consideration, Barbie Beekeeper. That's right, Barbie <laughs> Beekeeper. Something in the air just screams that it's time for a new Barbie personality. And what better time for Barbie to become a beekeeper than right now? The world has gone to crap, and the honeybee can fix what ails you. But the bees need some help, and who better than Barbie to lend a helping hand? After all, she's been the queen of churning out liquid gold for decades, despite being saddled with the presence and so-called assistance of useless male drones. Oh, good. Thank you, thank you. Big, oh, no, thank you to the sponsors. Um, big agriculture, <laughs> big chemical, human-caused pollution, habitat reduction, and climate change are all threats to the existence, the very being of the bee. But none of those enemies together alone are any match for matriarchal communist collectives that fly, buzz, get drunk on nectar, take care of friends with gallons of honey and salves, and take care of enemies with a painful and poisonous stinger. Bees kick ass, and with human friends they can kick more ass for longer times. And Barbie Beekeeper is the perfect advocacy doll to show us the way. And think of all the future apiarists she will inspire. That's a hard one, apiarists. <laughs> she comes complete with beehive gear, single piece uh, onesie beekeeper suit with complete head protection, a smoker, hive knife, Barbie beehive nostalgia wig, and EpiPen. <laughs> a well exercised, well accessorized Barbie at just $775. You can special order the basic unit without EpiPen for $25. <laughs> to Barbie or not to Barbie? That's not the question. Barbie Beekeeper. That's the answer. Presented by Nottel, in no way related to Mattel, but toy makers, recreators, and proud sponsors of the Two Wheel Cinema Club. That's Barbie spelled B A R B E. Yeah, you don't even know what he is. <laughs> and we are back from the apiary uh 40 years before dumb money there was trading places 1983 uh big hit it was like something like the second highest grossing film of the year i wow. think in 1983 um, wasn't expected to do nearly as well as it did. Uh, Trading Places, directed by John Landis. Um, so he uh, he had got his start with Kentucky Fried Movie, which I never saw. Animal That's House, yeah. which uh-huh. I have. Yeah. Um, the Blues Brothers, then yeah. American Werewolf in London. Wow. Uh, and then Trading Places came, um, uh, came next. Written by uh, Timothy Harris and Herschel Weingrod, uh, who incidentally was a graduate of London Film School, the same film that you and I met at. No way. Yeah. Herschel was? Herschel was, yes. What do you know? Is he an American? I think they are both American, but Timothy Harris grew up in the UK. Oh, okay. But Herschel is an American, yeah. Huh. So no, no shortage of connections in uh, this, this week's episode. Mm-hmm. So uh, previously they had written a film called Cheaper to Keep Her, which I've never seen nor heard mm. of. Um, 
Uh, so after that, they wrote this, and then they went on to write Brewster's Millions. Oh, yeah, um, that's right. Twins, the Arnold Schwarzenegger film, Kindergarten Cop, the yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger film. Um, and after all that, they produced the Michael Douglas picture, Falling Down. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so these guys turned into kind of uh, Hollywood middleweights. The the film itself was was nominated for a BAFTA screenplay award. Really, uh, didn't get it. It lost to King of Comedy. Mm. Um, difficult to imagine that King of Comedy was released the same year as Trading Places because in my mind, Trading Places feels more modern than King of Comedy. Yeah. But, uh, it got an Oscar nomination for score, but that is all for Elmer Bernstein. Elmer Bernstein. Yeah. Huh. So I I'm uh, I I think. I'm trying to remember which of us chose this movie. I think it was me or was it you? I think it was you. Tell me why. Tell me why. Do you have any other questions for me, Council? It's a good match. I mean, I think it, I think it is a good match, but that's kind of luck more than design. Oh, okay. This, um, these days, whenever we turn on uh, YouTube, we get an advert from Kiefer Sutherland uh, advertising this app on the phone called something like Fortune 500 Plus, something like that, or trading 500 plus oh. some kind of uh, trading app that he obviously is so desperately poor he <laughs> needs to advertise um but he, even though there is an app for it now i think i think wall street investment is you know, is still as opaque now as it was in 1983 yeah absolutely um you know and, so, and if you want to make a film about little people taking on wall street and winning then trading places is the obvious comparator isn't it yeah um and like you i i saw this film did you see this film when it was first out 40 years ago? I did. I hate admitting I, that, but you yeah, I, I, yeah, I did. Um, yeah, my kind of teenage self was extremely excited by this film when I went to see it at the local Odeon. Yeah. Um, these days, when, when uh, Trading Places comes on television in the UK, it comes with a disclaimer. Uh, apparently, uh, they broadcast this message which says that this film has outdated attitudes, language and cultural depictions which may cause offence today. Um, and so once I'd read that, I thought, oh, man, I've really got to see this again to see whether it does <laughs> cause offence. Does it cause offence? And I think, actually, yes, they were kind of right. Where did you see? You saw that when you streamed it? It came up in that message? No, no, it did, it, no, it did not. But I think when they broadcast it on Sky Television, they have the, to. So, oh, that's yeah, they, they put this disclaimer. See, I, I will, I, at the outset, I should probably say this. Uh, either I haven't aged very well. <laughs> or this film hasn't aged very well, but I do remember seeing this film in a room of college students because it played on the campus. So I might have seen it like a year later or something like that. And I was probably 15 or 16 years old. I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> it was this big room of young people <laughs> laughing. It's not the same film. It's not the film that I remember, but um, that's probably more about just me aging as well as the film aging. I don't know. I, I'm not sure I've aged... Uh, in quite the same way as you, because yeah. uh, I laughed uproariously <laughs> watching this film. <laughs> to the extent I was watching it um, at home downstairs, and Rachel was working upstairs, and yeah. she came down and said, "What are you laughing oh, at?" Really? <laughs> yeah, and I said, "Oh, it's Trading Places. It's really funny." And she said, uh, "Oh, good. Do you think the children would enjoy it?" And I immediately said, "No, no, no, no that's not no. appropriate." No. Well, maybe in your synopsis we can find out why it's inappropriate. Speaking of a synopsis, I've got one here. Shall oh. I tell you the synopsis? <laughs> So, uh, shocker, right at the beginning of the synopsis, uh, Trading Places at a film set in Philadelphia. I had no idea. I always assumed it was New York, but no. Yeah. It's Philadelphia, the early 1980s. Uh, and young commodities broker Louis Winthorpe is living the good life. Uh, it's Dan Aykroyd. He's making millions for a brokerage firm run by the elderly Duke brothers. He's living in a beautiful townhouse. He's got a butler. He has a high society marriage planned. Uh, it's all working out for him until homeless beggar Billy Valentine, who is Eddie Murphy, accidentally bumps into Winthorpe as he exits its private club. And uh, and Valentine gets arrested for theft and resisting arrest. And at this point, the Duke brothers, the elderly brokers, see an opportunity for an experiment. They systematically take everything from Winthorpe, his home, his job, his life, and they give it all to Valentine, who turns out, now that he has been given the opportunity, to be a successful and intelligent investor. But 
when Valentine and Winthorpe find out that they have been pawns in the Duke brothers' game, they join forces to get their revenge. Ellipsis. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, oh, why did I need to have a dun, dun, dun jingle? Because that's I what I put at the end of every single synopsis. <laughs> I tell you what, um, it probably is worth ringing a spoiler bell for this 40-year-old film. Because yeah. there will be some people, people under 40, who might not have seen it. Yeah. Um, before we ring the spoiler bell, I'm going to point out that this film begins, you know, after we saw Dumb Money with its weak opening, this film begins with an absolutely beautiful cinematic essay on wealth inequality. Yeah. Um, just over the opening credits, it's got this footage that would fit in fine within um, Coriana Scarzi. Have you seen that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love which is that kind of, yes, silent documentary yeah. film with a Philip Glass score about yeah. uh, crazy modern life. So you know, in, in this kind of cinematic essay, there's we just kind of watch lots of people, often people of colour, working hard jobs. They're unpacking at the meat market. They're queuing for buses. They're sleeping in doorways. Yeah. Um, while statues of the founding fathers or the the great and the good and the wealthy look on, it's covered in dung. Um, I, I think this is probably the most eloquent and inquiring part of the whole film. This little opening sequence um, over the beginning of the film is just terrific. It's dynamite, I think. Yeah. I, you said you always thought it was set in New York City. And my first note on this film was Philadelphia, comma, why? <laughs> Um, it makes a little bit of sense. It, uh, um, presumably it, something to do with like permits, a, I'm guessing. <laughs> probably, yeah, where you get the money and where you can actually film. Um, <laughs> but it's also, it has a history of being more working class than uh, New York City. So I think it does make sense. And you're right, it's a, it sets up the entire economics of the of the film. It feels very different from once the film gets going, which is you know sort of a broad comedy, of course. Um, but it does open. I guess you you nailed it right there. You said something about a video essay. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder. About, I presume that it's all second unit uh, material, isn't it? It's probably yeah. not John Landis who's filmed this. Is there some <laughs> very uh, talented second unit director? And we ought to find out who that is and yeah. find out what they went on to do because yeah. it's you know it's a lovely little short film at the beginning of yeah, the film. Yeah, it is nice. Um, right. Well, shall we ring the spoiler bell then? Yeah, now and spoil the rest it. of the 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 uh, frankly uh, straightforward comedic nature of the rest of the story. Here yeah, we go. Let's yeah. ring the bell. Um, so, I mean, you know, the rest of the film after this opening essay is, pr- is pretty conventionally structured. I did. I checked my watch uh, watching it um, and it posits its thesis at eight minutes in exactly. So at eight minutes yeah. in, one of the characters openly states the theme of the film. Yeah. Uh, which is nature versus nurture. Exactly. In nurture, they, they lay it out kind of very explicitly. Um, the Duke brothers recruit Valentine to their scheme at pretty much exactly 30 minutes in. So that is you know, exactly the end of the first act, I suppose. You know, there's a really clear midpoint when um, Winthorpe, having had everything taken from him, he's at his lowest ebb and he tries to shoot himself. That's when he's at his, you know, his very, very lowest point and then he slowly climbs back out of the hole. Um, you know, and there's a really clearly delineated third act when everything, you know, changes totally in tone from the rest of the film. It's funny. It's like we get like an hour or so of, of poor man and rich man swap places. Uh, and, you know, and you have all that kind of uh, culture clash comedy and, you know, the, 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 the sort of life swap. And then suddenly, all of a sudden for the third act, the film turns into Animal House. Like yeah. for 15 minutes, there's <laughs> like this crazy heist. It doesn't make any sense. It could have been done a thousand different better ways. Um, to, to the extent that it really looks like John Landis had some leftover footage from Animal House, yeah, you know, and and, and needed to use it to fulfil some sort of contract. So there's this kind of very weird Animal House fifteen minutes in the middle of, in the middle of the third act. It's um, it's mad. But for all that, I did laugh. Did you laugh? I laughed a little bit. There was there were just so many uncomfortable moments too, though that were. Uh... <laughs> Interrupt the laughter because um, you just never knew what was going to come next. Um, it's a little. There's some racist stuff. There's some sexist <laughs> stuff. There's some just oh, yes. some language Goodness. we don't use anymore. I believe <gasps> there's a gorilla that sodomizes someone who's in a gorilla <laughs> outfit. <laughs> So whenever I started thinking about things, I thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't be laughing. Maybe this is no longer <laughs> funny. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a fine line between what is broad comedy and humorous and what is just inappropriate or or <laughs> aged, I guess, in, in, in yeah, properly Yeah, perfectly aged. appropriate in the 80s it was. Oh, yes, yeah. it was fine back then. 
Um, it, this film, it did remind me how funny Eddie Murphy is. I mean, I think he is hilarious in this film. He's great. This was his second feature. He'd, he'd been in 48 Hours and he'd been in Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Um, and then he was kind of... 48 Hours had done much better than anybody expected. Yeah. And so suddenly he was this kind of nascent star and he was kind of grabbed. And this was what um, acted as a kind of slingshot and threw him right up to the, the top of the heap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's kind of so many great gags. There's this moment which I remember guffawing at as a boy, which mm-hmm. made me guffaw again today, when um, Valentine is uh, having the uh, the stock market explained to him, and the Duke brothers kind of say, "Oh, we deal in pork bellies. Pork bellies are what make bacon, which you might find in a bacon lettuce and tomato sandwich." Yeah. And kind of Eddie Murphy kind of breaks the fourth wall and just looks at the at the camera, and it's What's just the hilarious. Yeah. And it's very funny. Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of great scenes. I mean, Dan Aykroyd, I think, for all that he plays, you know, in a fairly appalling character, he still gets plenty of good gags. Um, there's a scene when he's at his lowest ebb and he goes to a pawn shop um, trying to get some money. And at the very end of the scene, he notices there's a gun for the sale and he just says, how much for the gun? And the scene cuts immediately. And it's a great gag. It's just a great cut. It's, um, you know, skillfully done. There's, there's a guy when uh, Valentine is locked up in the in the local prison there's a guy in the yeah. cell with him who just says yeah <laughs> you know to, to, in response to anything that anybody else says and that guy was imitated by every single boy in my school when i was <laughs> at school yeah there was always some kid who'd say yeah <laughs> like the guy out of uh, out of trading places it, you know it was hilarious gag so hilarious that it was repeated thousands yeah. of times for the next few years but there's a bunch of funny gags. I laughed. Yeah, I think uh, for me, one thing that happens really too fast is the the development of the characters when they actually do trade places. Because um, that that first act, um, you know, Eddie, Eddie Murphy's character, Billy Valentine, really becomes a stock market expert very quickly. And <laughs> it's no time before Dan Aykroyd is... Um, shacking up with a with a prostitute um and and he gets and and immediately going to this the suicide thing with the gun i think it's actually kind of an inelegant moment when the 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 suicide is sort of uh taken so lightly um yeah he he gets there very fast i mean i understand that the you know they want to get the story going and and moving into that last act where they sort of team up and and seek revenge but um as a result the, the characters aren't super believable it's broad comedy so i don't think it's supposed to be that believable but they, they those character journeys happen so quickly that it's almost you know overnight magic where ooh, they just uh, completely trade places um and that's the point of the film that's the title of the film i guess so, i mean it sort of makes sense but i it, for me it just felt a little too easy yeah yep and yep. as you mentioned before i think this i was reminded of some student films uh, with this this film, so, some uh, some story things just didn't seem very well thought out. When when um, Al Franken and uh, Tom is it Tom Harris who comes in as the 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 baggage boys, right? Yes, and they're I think they're carting around the gorilla at one point. I mean that all that stuff just seemed out of the blue. And you're right, even um, John Belushi's younger brother James Belushi is in there. It does seem like it's almost ad- Animal House in this one car on a train. They're taking a train from Philadelphia to New York. Again, it didn't make a whole lot of sense, and I think it was New Year's Eve. Well, there's the shoot, the suitcase, or the briefcase uh, switches and all that. There's this um, this uh, ruse to try and um, undermine the, the Duke brothers' chances of uh, manipulating the is it frozen orange juice market? So the yeah. important documents being being exchanged and all that. It does take this very different turn the entire <laughs> third act, and it gets quite ridiculous. Um, and there, there will be many, many more logical and uh, <laughs> you know, sensible ways that would retain the tone of the film yeah. to steal this 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 um, this briefcase. But you know, for some reason, it's you know, it's vitally important that that Denham Elliott dresses up as an Irish priest, and then yeah, um, you know, and Jamie Lee Curtis has to be a kind of like a you know a Swedish, a Swedish or maybe German tourist. Exactly. It doesn't really make yeah. any sense. You know, apparently she was supposed to be German but couldn't do the accent, so they got her to be Swedish, but they didn't change the outfit. She, I think it was just to get her into a small pair of shorts. <sighs> this film doesn't really like women very much, does it? There are only two women in it. Basically, there is there is Penelope, who is the the fiance, you know, and and she's kind of you know portrayed as a shallow and fickle character. Although to be fair, she is pretty hard done by actually. Yeah. 
And then the only other woman who's in it is Jamie Lee Curtis. And she largely earns her place in the film by taking her clothes off pretty often. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of surprised. In fact, she, you know, she's a great actor, very accomplished. And she had already had hits with Halloween. Yep. Um, but in this film, you know, her character is more or less just kind of boobs. Um, you know, I'm completely unconvinced, by the way, that she takes Dan Aykroyd in and then falls in love with him. I have yeah. no idea why. It feels completely unearned. Precisely. You know, yeah. The scene looks like it was written by a man, oh, which turns out it was. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a film you know, written and made by men, and it's, you know, it's very male gazy. Yeah. Um, you know, and there is no story reason for Jamie Lee Curtis to be taking her clothes off quite this often. It happens quite often. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I have no complaint seeing private parts on screen. However, you need some context. There has to be some sort of reason. Whereas <laughs> there are a handful of breast shots in this film, and they're all just out of the blue. And she's not the only one who bears breasts kind of just ne uh, needlessly. It's a, uh, yeah, the, the, to a certain extent, this film is also about Jamie Lee Curtis's body. And I think. She made a film called Perfect. Is that right before this, or uh, I think that which is about like sort of bodybuilding and working ah, out. I right. Think. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's that was a little unsettling. Yeah, and again, just because it just it happened for no, it didn't it didn't move the story forward, and their relationship as lovers didn't really make any sense. It's but it's just such a standard eighties trope, it, isn't it? Women yeah. taking their tops off. It used yeah. to be like a you know a thing that pretty much every film would have a scene set in a strip bar for no reason. It was a complete staple of 80s cinema. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it and it's kind of it just looks so strange now. It really doesn't play, but it's you know, it's really one of the things that dates the films the films um a lot. Uh but the the other thing which you know that Sky Television uh, disclaimer warns about yeah. is attitudes to race. And yeah. I was, you know, kind of a little bit confused because you know it starts out with this disclaimer, you know, it tells you that it's dated, and then early on um, there is a scene where Eddie Murphy is being chased around by the police, you know, and frankly, it looks like an SNL Black Lives Matter sketch. I mean, it feels really, really contemporary to yeah. me, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, we have like scenes of three white men laughing at Eddie Murphy as he looks around Winthorpe's house. I mean, it, you know, it says a lot about the attitudes of the, the characters. And then once he becomes, you know, the the more confident broker, then Eddie Murphy, he calls Coleman his own personal slave. I mean, you know, the script is pretty savvy. It yeah. has a lot to say about racism. Yeah. The, the fact that the Duke brothers, you know, are are racist, yeah. you know, that they use the N-word. Mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of the central reason that Valentine wants to get his revenge on them, I think. Yeah. You know, they get the max. They use the N-word once and they get absolute maximum impact out of it. Yeah. So it's dramatically, it's an appropriate use of the word. I thought, actually... Um, as far as attitudes to race go, this film, I hate using this word, but I'm going to use it. This film is pretty woke. Um, uh, but um, I was feeling kind of quite smug about it, having a degree of modernity. And then in the third act, it yeah. ruins it all by having Dan Aykroyd <laughs> wear this kind of blackface makeup <laughs> for no yes. reason at all. Yeah. And it's like all that goodwill is then just suddenly poured out on the ground and soaks into the into the grass. It's, it's no, it's no, um, yeah. 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 So they kind of blow it. I remember being shocked by that. I don't. I don't. I don't remember that from forty years ago, obviously. But um, yeah, that's he, what is he? He's a sort of a. He might be Jamaican. I um, think so. Cla claims to have met um, the, the 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 Eddie the Eddie Murphy character at some sort of conference somewhere. And Eddie Murphy at that point almost looks like he's in a role for what's is it coming to America? He's playing yeah, this uh, yeah, that's what it looks student. like, isn't it? It's almost like a little a taster of a, a forthcoming role. Um, yeah, it seems very inappropriate. Um, and I think, you know, I think that moment where the N-word comes out and the Dukes are outed as racists, I think it's also coupled with the $1 bet that makes it feel so, uh, um, yeah, makes, yeah, the spite arises in, um, in Eddie Murphy's character, Billy Valentine, as a result of that moment, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I think it is kind of woke. I mean, that's the way it is. I mean, I, they beautifully depict the stock market as all white guys hanging out at the Heritage Club <laughs> and just manipulating the market to try and... Uh, you know, preserve and increase their wealth. So I think it is, it it has its woke bits, you're right, but then it, it's sort of undone by the attitudes towards uh, women and women's bodies and then, you know, the blackface and <laughs> a few major missteps, let's put it that way. It, it tries to have its cake and then smash its cake on the floor <laughs> and stamp on the cake really, really hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're right, it's a good point. Yeah, the, the, the Heritage Club is this place where <laughs> yeah. you know, like the Duke brothers and the Winthorpe, and Winthorpe, like their members, yeah. uh, you know, and they go to sort of um, 
you know, read the newspaper and drink tea or whatever. Yeah. And um, you know, and the whole way that club is photographed, it's like it's a whole set of white men in suits yeah. sitting in front of portraits of older white men in suits. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, it's not subtle. It's clear the point they're making. Yeah. But you know, they're making it really well. They do. Yeah. And the, the name. Great choice, the Heritage Club. I don't know if they actually exist. They just had it on the building, <laughs> yes. but the Heritage Club is perfect. So, I mean, it, it, it definitely has a commentary, which some of these films uh, that deal with financials do not have, and we'll probably talk about that when we synthesize a little bit, but there's definitely yeah. a commentary on the stock market in this film, and I, I appreciated that. I think this film has the, like the best explanation of the, of the stock market of any of the films I've seen on that topic. We've, you know, we watched Dumb Money. We I watched The Big Short. Have you seen that? I have seen that. Yeah, I'll mention yeah, that later, I think. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, it also tries to explain the workings of the financial system. But in Trading Places, there's a scene where, you know, the Duke brothers explain how it works to Eddie Murphy. And Eddie Murphy turns to him and he says, you guys are a couple of bookies. Yeah. yeah and, and that explains the whole stock market yeah. better than any of those other films. That's and he does right. it in like seven words. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But all that said, I, you know. Good films, and I'm not going to say this is a bad film. I enjoyed this film and I laughed, and there are good things about this film. Good films are about characters, and mm-hmm. there are some really good characters in mm-hmm. this film. Yeah, um, uh, I think the good the good characters are Valentine. I think Eddie Murphy's character is actually layered and nuanced and fairly self aware. Yeah, I and mean, he's clever, but he's not too clever. I mean, I think it's a very good performance. It's a well written role. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, this is a good character, well-written. And the other character who really, really stands out is Coleman, the butler character, yes. played by Denham Elliott. I think he's like the heart, emotional heart of the film. Yes. I think I think the best scene, the one that shows the most character growth, I think, is this really simple scene. Valentine invites a whole bunch of, of fr- old friends from the bar around to his house, yeah. you know, and they trash the place, and you know, he throws them all out. And after he's thrown them out, he turns to Coleman and he says, Thanks. You know, and this is something that Coleman has never really heard from Winthorpe. Yeah. You know, not as not like a, as an equal, just having someone say thank you for doing all yeah. this stuff. It's and it's a lovely scene. And like the second best scene is also Coleman, where he has to pretend that he doesn't recognize Winthorpe, who's trying to get back into his old house, which yeah. has now been taken from him. Yeah. You know, because he, he you know, pretends not to recognize him, but his face betrays him. And, you know, it's not subtle. Yeah. You know, it's probably a bit overplayed, if anything. But it, I think it's. You know, a nice example of the kind of scene where the meaning of the scene and the dialogue are completely opposite. It's a nice scene. And, you know, it's a good little character moment. I feel like we saw him recently in Dial of Destiny, maybe, or... Oh, did we? We said, Well, we certainly saw him in... Or was it the earlier one, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Or... Raiders of the Lost Ark, okay. yeah. Which, and... So that was three years earlier than this film, oh, okay. wasn't it? Yeah. So, oh, yeah, that was, that okay, was that's why, yeah. Uh, an early part of Denham Elliott's Hollywood career. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think... Um... It has good points. It definitely does. And I mean, for me, I really love the this idea of the wealthy just playing with other people's lives. Um, there's a little bit of white savior thing going on there, but then it comes oh, yeah. back to, you know, it's a revenge against the white savior. I like that little angle. So it, it definitely has some, some good moments. And I think that's why we think back on it as being a, a film um, that was so, so monumental to our lives is... Whew, Boy, tweeners is what do they call it? Like, like I was probably, oh my goodness, yeah, something <laughs> 12, 13, 14 years old. So it made an impression. It seems ludicrous to describe trading places as progressive <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> when there are quite so many bare breasts in it, but well, you know, but but uh, there's there's a progressive side to it and yeah. a less progressive side. The amazing thing is, I don't remember the breasts. I would have, you know, that would have, oh my goodness, I would have come to this film a little differently. I thought, oh yeah, this is that film where we saw so much of Jimmy Lee Curtis's body, but that that. That didn't ring a bell because her character is not that major. Um, she's given, you know, she's given some depth. She's, you know, she knows about Shakespeare and Ophelia, her name and all that. And she seems to know a little bit. She saved money. You know, she's like a smart, um, a smart young woman. Um, but it's it's one of these things where Hollywood just doesn't get prostitutes. I mean, they don't, they never look like the ones in my neighborhood. You know, it's just like, a, <laughs> it's a completely different thing. They're all, you know, educated and they look great and uh, they're smart and, um, they're the hookers with the heart of gold and all that. So, uh, are, are we uh, are we thinking about phoning the cliche squad here? Well, that's that's the only one I got. Remember, I wrote that for the wrong film, so I feel terrible about placing a. <laughs> no, we cannot unless you want to. I would say no. I don't want to bother the cliche squad again. I tell you what. I, instead, I'm going to play a different jingle because oh. uh, we, we are, we'll, we'll do a synthesis. Okay. And we'll we'll bring the two films together, and there's lots of ways they fit together. Oh, good. Um, but before we do that, let's play. Oh, who am I? <laughs> Who am I? 
And I, as always, mm-hmm. every week, I can never remember who, who goes first. Do you want to go first? I will. I think you went first last year. Last year. Oh, did I? Last okay, week. Right. Boy, it's been a while. <laughs> We're back. We're back. Razor's back. <laughs> I'm back. No more self-driving car fiascos. Um, <laughs> Kevin, Pete Davidson character. Um, oh. Just stumbling on insights while more often than not saying stupid, half-witty things. <laughs> Living at home. That is not you. Underemployed, (laughs) benefited from being surrounded by stellar and generous people. It takes a village, they say. (laughs) I'm Pete Davidson's character, Kevin. Uh, There's a moment in Dumb Money when, um, like, the whole family goes to, like, Keith Gill's parents' house. Yeah. Uh, yeah, And and Keith's dad, who was played by Clancy Brown, he shouts at his sons to help their mother at mealtime. And I think, oh, yeah, that's me shouting at my kids to say, oh, go help your mother. Go lay the table, will you? Get some forks out of the drawer. Yeah, I I did see myself there. Oh, there you go. Um, (laughs) Angry dad shouting at dinner. Um, In in trading places, you see, I would like to imagine that I was was Denim Elliott. Oh, yeah. You know, the uh, the tremendously capable butler and the emotional heart of the film. But I suspect, actually, you know, who I probably am is just Winthorpe. Oh. Um, Dan Aykroyd's character, Could who be. is just Could privileged be. and crass. That's probably who I am, sadly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In that film, I think I'm just uh, this character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and every other boy at my school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other person I really sympathised with in um, Trading Places is in that opening montage, you get a little shot of the Philadelphia bus station. Oh, yeah. And there's a woman who's running for a bus as, oh. it, as the door's shut and it pulls away. And I've been yeah, that oh, woman goodness. so many times oh. in my life. Yeah, that takes Just us- missing the bus. Oh, my heart went out to her. I think that takes us back to um, Sliding Doors a couple weeks ago when I felt. Oh, yeah, just yep. So many times missing tube trains. And- <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yep. All right. That's definitely yeah. You can definitely identify with those people. The little the little guys missing the buses, missing the real inside trading and the big bucks. That's who we are. Ah, uh, it's subtext. You see subtext. Yeah. Okay, let's let's, let's draw the two films together. See if we can. So. I'll tell you what, um, Trading Places and Dumb Money, they've got one thing which they definitely have in common, which is both of these films believe that winning means getting rich. You know, both films superficially suggest that they are come somehow iconoclastic. They're smashing the system, but they're not really smashing any system. You yeah. know, that Dumb Money talks about a revolution, but there's no storming of barricades. There's no kicking over of statues. Yeah. We just have you know a set of rich people in nice houses and then a sort of set of of fairly poor people who wish they lived in the nice houses and they are hoping that their ship comes in so that they can move into the same street as Seth Rogen. I think, yeah, I think that's, you know, that's the moral of the film and it's the same in trading places. The winners become rich, not liberated. You know, they enjoy, you know, after they make loads of money at the end of trading places, you know, the three winners, they get a trip or the four winners, they get a trip to a tropical Island um, with food, women and drink. Yeah. Um, You know, the losers lose their money. It's not a moral lesson. You know, there's, there's, there isn't kind of an enriching moment of character growth. Um, I was trying to imagine, I was trying to think of an analogy. I was thinking if these films were about the French Revolution rather than trading on the stock market, then yeah. at the end of the film, the peasants wouldn't have used guillotines on the bourgeoisie. They just would have demanded their own wigs so that they could keep up with the king. <laughs> we want better wigs, please. That's that's kind of what it's about. Yeah. But I think both films kind of support the status quo. Um, which is, you know, I suppose why I'm a little bit disappointed about the lack of progress in some aspects of, of trading places. And I think in dumb money as well. Mm. Cash equals win. That's what both of these films say. That cats win? Cash, cash equals win. Oh. Also cats, but you're right. Cats equals cash Warren win. Kitty. You're right. I don't know that there's, <laughs> there's no cat in uh, trading places. There's a lot of talk about orange juice and pork bellies, but not nary a cat to be found. I don't think. Anyway, um, yeah, I think you've got some good points there. For me, obviously, they're both about the invisible hand of the wealthy having their way with the little people. I think they both stories touch on that really well, and both of them are about little guys sort of getting back, getting revenge 
which I think is nice. And they're also both about doing that through some sort of teamwork or connection. Ah, yeah, you're right. You can never get back at the the big guys alone. I don't think that's likely, but you can sort of join forces to to revolt a little bit. So I think that that is um, consistent with both films. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Both of them take place around the holidays, Christmas and New Year, for some reason, which is you know a time of bounty. I think um, isn't doesn't Roaring Kitty raise a glass of champagne at one point? Obviously, they've been doing well, but I think it happens right around uh, the beginning of the year as well as yeah, it may it, yeah, it may well be yeah. And, and Trading Places certainly is a Christmas movie, isn't it? Yeah. It's a super compressed Christmas time frame. Yeah. So they are they share that holiday, which is very interesting because it is such a commercial holiday now. It's very, it's almost a celebration of capital, isn't it? Um, so they're they're both situated at that time. I think for me, we we had thought about pairing Dub Money with Wolf of Wall Street and Big Short, which you just mentioned. Um, right. And for me, the thing that those two films lack is really a critical point of view. Um, ah. on the cultures that they're exploring. Whereas these two films, which I think people would probably take much less seriously, they they definitely have a point of view. They're definitely they definitely indict um the hedge fund managers in Dumb Money or these mm. super wealthy racist old men in uh trading places. So I think there's much more commentary in these films than in those others. Like Wolf of Wall Street you got to envy Leonardo DiCaprio and his buddies, right? They're wealthy, <laughs> they're partying, they're with women, they've got drugs everywhere. You end up sort of wanting that lifestyle in a way that you, you did mention that, you know, people <laughs> in these two films that we're talking about this week, they want the money, they want to be rich. Um, but you're celebrating some really evil characters in that film. The big short, you've got some really uh, dishonest and conniving people in that film, but they're played by people like Steve Carell. Or, uh, uh. yeah, and, and you end up thinking, okay, well, if it's a... Steve Carell's a good guy. I want to be like him. <laughs> so I think for those those two films, both just really fell flat for me because we really need what we're seeing now and oddly what we saw 40 years ago. We need more critical eyes and points of views focused on the Wall Street guys, the the, the stock yeah. market, the, the, the hedge fund managers. So the, those films, both of these films do that pretty well. And I was surprised by that. Another, another way that these two films can be compared is... Um... Uh, well, <sighs> Trading Places is a film written by two men, you know, and it features, you know, quite a lot of women taking their clothes off. Dumb Money is a film written by two women, and I think the women in Dumb Money have agency at least. I mean, it's yeah. it is much more progressive in that point of view, isn't it? The, mm. the women in Dumb Money they have characters; they don't need to take their clothes off to to qualify to appear in the film. Yeah. But, um. One thing that kind of shocked me, and maybe this shows just how old I am. One thing that shocked me about Dumb Money uh, was its hip hop soundtrack, which I think has, seems to have an incredibly regressive attitude uh, towards race. I, there's a lot of shock that we hear the N word in um, Trading Places yeah. and it's a pivotal story moment. Whereas I feel like in Dumb Money, I heard the N word 20 or 30 times because it's repeated throughout in every song that gets played. Yeah. Um, I wonder whether that is one of the things about Dumb Money that's going to date this film, that it may end up actually being quite embarrassing in a few years' time, that you come back and you listen to the soundtrack and you think, oh, that's, that's a bit painful to yeah. listen to now. That was cool for a few years in the mid-2020s, and now I'm not so sure. I don't know. That's a good question, because um, it's like the N-word being reclaimed, of course, and, and I think what makes it so powerful in Trading Places is the fact that it's coming from two rich white guys who are playing around with the life of a black man and a, and a fellow human being and just treating them like commodities, which is what they do with everything. Whereas the hip hop, it didn't, I mean, I, I hear it so often in school and with my students all the time. So for me, it feels more, it feels different coming from an empowered black artist who's using it as part of this, you know, sort of cultural um, reclamation project. So I think it's interesting because it's uh, hip hop is definitely like the biggest selling music all around the world. At this point, so I don't. I think it will probably age well. I don't. I don't. I don't see that as a sticking point for me. Anyway, ah, maybe it's one of the things that looks different from the UK rather than from the US, yeah, perhaps. Okay, could. it could mm. for sure. Yeah. Uh, tell you what, the, the other thing that um, really contrasts between the two films is the way that people get information. Trading places comes from a time when people get their information from newspapers. Yeah, printed bits of paper. <laughs> you know, or crop reports kept in hidden, hidden in, in leather briefcases. 
You know, and this is a time when trades were made by shouting on a trading floor. I think, yeah, I think that still happens, though. That's the weird does, thing. Does that still happen? Is that, it, I believe so. I it, Is that right? It okay. makes no sense to me. I mean, not... I think that the dumb money trades are on phones and computers. We're talking about small money. I think the real trading probably still happens that way. Wow, okay. The big, the big money, yeah, absolutely. So I... It's confounding to me. It wouldn't have made sense to me 100 years ago, 40 years ago when they made that film, or even today. But I think it still happens that way. It's crazy. I mean, I, I quite like the scenes of all this kind of this shoving and pushing, these kind of <laughs> bodies crammed into the yeah. stock exchange. It contrasts yeah. so well with the, the isolation and the, you know, don't, don't touch, don't cough, don't breathe yeah. um, scenes in in dumb money where yeah. you know, people can't get close to each other and they have to talk over a distance and keep their masks on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I feel a little bit nostalgic for those times when you could <laughs> rub up against, no, 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 that came out wrong, but you know, uh, be close to other people's bodies yeah, yeah. in public. That, that came out quite badly as well. Well, I might, some... I might edit this conversation out <laughs> later on when I come to edit no, the show. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it all wrong. I think you, no, I think you, you've got a great point. It's point that, that the stock market has this barbarism about it and it's very inhuman on some level whereas the in the dumb money it's you know it's done from distance it's done on telephones and from people who are craving a different kind of humanity i think and uh, and much less barbarism and i think it it's it's a i think you've made a good point i think it's worth exploring that um but it's it's it makes no sense to me as a scene you know eddie murphy and and Ackroyd, who don't really know a lot about the stock market, I, I don't think. I mean, Ackroyd, I guess, is the expert at that point. But all of a sudden, they're on the floor. I mean, in realist, it's not realistic at all, and it's not really v- well explained. But I think just as a point, a visual point, this is insane. This is how it works, and these are the guys who benefit <laughs> from it. And we're going to go in there and, and make them pay a little bit. So I think it's a good scene, and I think, you're, no, I think your point is well taken. I think it's a good one. We know for sure that the people who made dumb money will have watched Trading Places. Yep. I wonder whether we will still be watching Dumb Money in 40 years' time or whether by the time we get that far, Chat GPT will be doing all the trading for us and you know there'll be no more human in- input at all. Yeah, as I said before, I think this is a very precise moment film. I don't think it's going to have uh, like a lingering effect. I think people will go back and watch it. Uh, maybe if they want to understand that trading um episode that event in in financial history but it's yeah it's very much that pandemic 2021 we can see it now but i think it'll have less impact in the future but it's you know it's a good moment a lot of a lot of um films are just made for the moment these days because stuff gets made fast it gets on the streaming service or in the theaters fast and then it's gone very ephemeral times we're living in we have to we have to hold on to history even the bad bits Mm -hmm. okay um well Just got enough time to talk about what else has been playing uh, at our theatres. So I'm I'm going to go first. You have to. uh, We watched something else last night. We watched Elemental, which is the new Pixar film. Um, which has oh. fairly recently come onto Disney Plus. Yeah. It, it had it had longer legs um, at the box office over this last summer than than people initially imagined. I think it yeah. had quite an interesting um, kind of performance where it flopped a little bit, and then it kind of rallied on word of mouth and ended up doing fairly well. Um, and yeah, we all sat and watched it together as a family, and we enjoyed it. And it's Romeo and Juliet. I mean, it's beautifully <sighs> animated. It looks great. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's you know it has some reasonably simple characters and it's not a very new story but it's reasonably well done it's not absolute grade a pixar but it's um at the top end of their grade b and it's good fun enjoyed it is it um house of fire versus house of ice something like that yeah that's exactly what it is it's house of fire versus house of water exactly water water, okay but it's kind of it's it's um told as an immigrant story so you know, oh. The fire people, are, are, they're immigrants from abroad, you know, Ooh. trying to establish themselves and they live in a poor part of town. Uh, but she falls in love with the water boy who lives in the rich part of town and he's kind of you know wealthy. But yeah. he, you know, so unsurprisingly, he is also a, a little bit wet. Uh-huh. Um, and whereas she is, you know, a little bit sort of you know, fiery and temperamental. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's not a stretch, but it's, it's cutely written and it's you know, enjoyable. Excellent. And it has a happier ending than Romeo and Juliet as well. Uh, yes. Well, there's a lot of death. <laughs> in the end of Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, they all survived at the end of the final reel. 
Well, what have you seen? Um, well, speaking of Shakespeare connection, Ooh. yes, Throne of Blood, 1957, <gasps> Akira Kurosawa film. Oh, you always have to outdo me. Uh, I, I watched a Pixar film, you watched Kurosawa. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to tell you about the the venue and how I saw it because I think that is also interesting. But it is sort of a retelling of Macbeth, um, which in 1957 maybe a lot of Japanese didn't have that much experience with with oh. Shakespeare, but probably. I mean, it's just it had already been around for hundreds of years, so I imagine it got to Japan in one form or another. Um, but it felt like it's a it's a little bit loose, but it's definitely uh, Macbeth, and you you sort of realize that. By the time that someone starts telling the um, some, some soothsaying, I guess happens, um, and you realize, uh. oh, that's a spirit telling the the, the story of Macbeth. Basically, um, there's an interesting group here in Portland, Maine, and anyone nearby I would invite you to look into them a little bit. It's called Kinonik, um, and it's a cinema group, and somehow they've inherited a lot of these films um, on either 16 or, in some cases, um, 35 millimeter, but it's generally 16 Whoa. millimeter. So I was just walking through. Um, they have this warehouse, and on, on Tuesday nights, every Tuesday night, they show something on film. And I went down there last time for last week for the first time. They've got a new location, so I hadn't seen one of their films in quite a while. But they're in this sort of a warehouse on the waterfront. It's a little bizarre, and I thought for sure it's going to be six or seven people there, and they're all going to be like very close to death, like white and blue <laughs> hair. And I was going to be the youngest person there. Turns out there were like forty or fifty people there. Oh. Um, and you know, it's a beat up print. It's probably from the 1950s or sixties. Wow. Um, and there were young, I was not the youngest person there, which kind of disappointed oh. me because I like the old people events cause I feel young, but there were people <laughs> younger than I was there and they've got everything and they're showing, uh, uh, Key Largo in a couple of weeks. I think they had, um, um, some Fellini films recently, um, uh, Dolce Vita, I think they'd shown um, some Charlie Chaplin. So they're showing all these old films. And I think there was an old cinematographer who, he might still be alive, but he has just a fantastic film collection. So it's in this well-tempered um, room so that the films are protected. And they just show a, cup, a film every week. It's very interesting. You don't see things on on proper film very often anymore. You see the, the cigarette yeah. burns on the film and their hair is all over the place and you can hear the rattling of the projector in the back of the room. But oh, it's, it's definitely it's a, a such great a romantic experience. noise. Oh, it's fantastic. So it's good to see that. Um, and then I also saw a film called Duel on Hulu because um, on another podcast, I, I've got to stop mentioning other podcasts, but <laughs> I heard... No, go it, ahead. Promote I, another podcast. Why not? Mark Maron's WTF. He had Naomi Klein on recently as a leftist right. uh, Canadian journalist, and she wrote a book called Doppelganger about having a double. And she oh, recommended right. this film called Duel, which I'm going to recommend. It's on Hulu. But this is this is not um, the, like the Spielberg made for TV. No, this came debut. out I okay. think two years ago. It's either twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two. Fairly recent. Um, it's ostensibly an American film. It's definitely shot in Finland. It's about this culture where it's not really placed in any time. It feels fairly modern, but you don't see any technology. You don't see uh, phones or any computers at all, really. So it's very interesting. But when you're dying, you can have a clone made of yourself. And then in these cases where you don't die, you battle the clone oh. to death Oh, to see who gets to survive. You can't have two pe- people um, living on. So it's just um, a really interesting uh, portrayal of this idea um, futuristic, but maybe not the far, that far in the future. And very absurd, though, because it, it, people are talking about stuff that just sounds absolutely insane, but it's just like no reaction whatsoever. Everyone's unfazed all the time. It, this, <laughs> it feels like this a culture that's just dumbed down to the point where this is acceptable. A woman goes into a store and says, well, I need something that I can die in in my duel. And the sales lady is just, okay, we, well, we have this. We recommend this one. And it's just <laughs> completely nonplussed by anything bizarre. And the language at first is very stilted, but then it really is effective eventually. And it's, uh, it's great. Um, I think it was Riley Stearns who made the film... Um, I can look up the name um, if we have time, but um, Dual, D-U-A-L. Check it out on Hulu. I really enjoyed it. I was surprised, Mm. pleasantly surprised. And is it a comedy or a horror? Ooh, it's it's not that horrible. It's um, it's definitely not that comic, but there there's dark (laughs) comedy in it because you just it's absurd, is what it is. So it's uh, absurd, Uh. but it's not laugh out loud absurd comedy. It's just very uh, it's witty. It's pointed. it's worth it. It's on. It's on the Hulu. Do you guys have the Hulu over there? 
I don't think we do. No, we don't. Oh boy, yeah, it's, uh, it was. Uh, but I think it's cut that. I think their properties are covered by other services, so it'll be it'll be on something. Yeah, honest, it'll be on something. Honestly, yeah. I don't have the Hulu either. We've got a very um, illicit family account. There are a lot of people who use this <laughs> one account, and it's funny because it's free anyway. I should just have my own account, but <laughs> I've been pirating a little bit. So Hulu's not listening. Is Hulu, is Hulu a sponsor? No, they won't anymore now. Obviously, <laughs> um, next time uh, we are looking at disruptive discoveries and inventions. We are watching BlackBerry, the yeah. uh, the new film about the uh, the invention of the smartphone, kind of, and uh, comparing it to There Will Be Blood. Um, we'll see how those two pair together. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, um, occupy Wall Street, yeah. smash the system, but only smash it a small amount, not too much. Uh, and join us next time. Goodbye, everyone.